Hi, this is Dr. Perry Carpenter. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to join me on today's program. Today's program is taken right out of the hypertrophy files. And the hypertrophy files are part of a series of lectures that I produce for you doctors uh, out of the basic science series for chiropractic continuing education. And today's program uh, is approved for six hours of continuing education in the general category uh, by the Board of Chiropractic Examiners. So uh, welcome to the program and thanks for joining me. I hope you enjoy today's program uh, quite a bit and that you get a lot out of it. The focus of today's program is going to be on two words and these are two words that I tell almost every one of my patients on almost every single visit that I have with them. And uh, these are some profound words and uh, you don't have to say really much more than these two words to your patients. And uh, if you're able to get a head nod from your patients uh, after you repeat this mantra uh, to them, you'll know that you're doing the very best thing that you can for them. And this applies to you as well. Uh, today's program is entitled Exercise Recommendations for Chiropractors and Their Patients. And so today's program is directed, first of all, doctors at you because uh, I know uh, what your life is like and I know what it's like to be a chiropractor because I am a chiropractor and I've been a chiropractor for 27 years and I know that being a chiropractor is, uh, is a physical job. It's, uh, it's a physically demanding, it's a heavy lifting job. So we have those physical demands on us also uh, as respected health care uh, authorities we also serve as role models to our patients so it's important that we practice what we preach and so I direct this program first and foremost to you doctor and then also uh, to your patients and the mantra and the two words that I constantly re reinforce both to myself and to my patients and, and that I want to impart to you and your patients is to up muscle up muscle it's the philosophy of this program and it's my uh, sincere opinion that we need to continually focus on increasing the muscle mass content of our body and this is regardless of age in fact uh, as we age through our uh, 30s 40s 50s 60s 70s 80s <laughs> I don't know where you lie on that spectrum, but uh, speaking for myself, uh, I'm probably at the midpoint of that spectrum and, and inching perhaps <laughs> slightly past the midpoint of that spectrum. And as we do age, it becomes even more important to focus on upping the muscle mass content of our bodies. So that's the whole purpose of our uh, program today is to learn how to preserve muscle mass and how to promote and grow new muscle mass regardless uh, of our age, regardless of our physical condition, or regardless of any limitations that we may think that we have uh, that prevent us from uh, doing just that, from building new muscle. So this is called the hypertrophy files and this is one of several lessons in the hypertrophy files which is a series of exercise, dietary, and lifestyle techniques uh, designed to promote muscle hypertrophy. So today we're going to talk about lesson number one from the hypertrophy files. And today we're going to focus on some exercise techniques involving and focusing on three very narrow principles. We're going to narrow this entire concept down to three simple, effective, and extremely powerful techniques that you and your patients can implement right away that will tremendously improve and enhance uh, the benefits that you get from standard exercise, whether those be performed in a health club or whether those be performed at home uh, with simple and inexpensive implements. And those three simple principles that we're going to focus on in this program include number one the biarticular muscles, the eccentric muscle actions, and the pre-stretch principle. 
and uh, of course we'll elaborate over the next six hours uh, on these three principles. So if you're ready with me, uh, I'd like you to grab your handout materials for your note-taking uh, benefit. Grab you a snack and a drink and uh, get ready to get down to some brass tacks of anatomy, physiology, and the science uh, behind muscle hypertrophy. So, with that as a background and with those studies uh, behind us, I hope that we're now all in agreement uh, that it's a good idea to work toward increasing the muscle mass content of our body and simultaneously uh, lowering our body fat and lowering our waist circumference. Uh, let's now begin about uh, the focus of this program uh, which is uh, increasing the muscle mass content of our body. And let's talk about some of the basics of hypertrophy and what it actually means uh, to have hypertrophy of our muscles. And let's begin with a discussion now uh, going all the way back to uh, your anatomy and physiology days. And let's get into a brief discussion now uh, of the muscle fiber types and uh, start learning how it is uh, that we can grow uh, our muscles. Okay, let's go all the way back to uh, college or perhaps chiropractic school and uh, let's review the different types of muscle fibers because an understanding of hypertrophy uh, first and foremost relies upon an understanding of the different types of muscle fibers and the capacity of those muscle fibers uh, for growth or hypertrophy. So uh, when we talk about muscle fiber types we consider that there's three main types of muscle fibers. Now this is not actually true. There have been many many different isoforms of muscle fibers uh, identified and I think at, at last review uh, there are more than 10 different isoforms of muscle fibers that have been identified but for our purposes we can classify muscle fibers into three main uh, classifications and these classifications are based on number one how fast these muscle fibers develop their maximum tension and then number two based upon how fast uh, those muscle fibers develop fatigue. So first is how fast they develop tension and then second how fast they develop fatigue and we find that those two characteristics are related in that muscles that develop their maximum tension quickly also uh, seem to fatigue quickly. So based on this classification uh, we identify fibers as either type 1 fibers or type 2 fibers and then within the classification of the type 2 fibers we have subcategory A and subcategory B so we have type 1, type 2A and type 2B fibers and each one of these types of fibers has different capacity for developing tension and also different capacity uh, for resisting fatigue and this is going to become important when we try to develop these muscles and increase the cross-sectional area uh, of these muscles. So here is a chart for those of you that are watching the PowerPoint presentation that shows uh, three different types of muscle fibers and these muscle fibers uh, have been extracted from different muscular areas throughout the body. Uh, one set of muscle fibers has been uh, extracted from the extraocular muscles. Uh, another set of fibers extracted from the gastrocnemius muscles. And a third set of fibers uh, extracted or uh, biopsied out of the soleus muscles. And you'll see by where they lie on the spectrum of this graph with time uh, on the x-axis and percentage of maximum tension on the y-axis, the extraocular muscles develop their maximum tension very quickly. But you'll notice that they fatigue also very quickly, approximately 20 milliseconds. The gastrocnemius muscles, they take a little bit longer, almost twice the time to develop their maximum tension. However, 
they're able to sustain that maximum tension for a greater period of time, indicating that they have greater resistance to fatigue. And then finally, the soleus muscle uh, develops its maximum tension uh, very slowly, not until about 80 milliseconds after uh, a single stimulus. But these muscles uh, fatigue very slowly and are able to sustain uh, high levels of tension for great periods of time. And if you think about the functions of these muscles in the body, uh, this makes sense that the soleus muscle is a perfectly designed muscle for uh, walking and postural control. And, and it's this resistance to fatigue of the soleus muscle that makes it possible for you to be able to walk almost indefinite periods of time. I mean, it's not uncommon to take uh, 20 minute walks and hour walks and two hour walks and, and, and even longer walks. And the reason we can do that is because of the capacity of the soleus muscle uh, to resist fatigue. Now, the extraocular muscles, on the other hand, they fatigue very quickly. And that makes sense uh, when you think about uh, activities of daily living and uh, activities that are very eyeball intensive, such as working on a computer uh, or working on calculations or reading fine print. Uh, these are muscles that fatigue quickly and, and those of us that are chiropractors are familiar with this phenomenon because the eyes uh, can be a source of headaches when they're subject to uh, extended and prolonged repetitive use. And this explains uh, part of the reason why. Now these different types of muscle fibers can also be classified by their metabolic strategy. So for example, the extraocular muscles, uh, we call these fast twitch muscles. We also call them fast glycolytic muscles to describe their metabolic strategy. So these muscles generate force quickly, but because uh, they have no capacity for aerobic metabolism. They also fatigue very quickly. Now the gastrocnemius muscles, these are also fast twitch muscles, uh, also the, in the type 2 uh, muscle fiber types. We call the type 1 muscle fibers, we call those slow twitch. The type 2s we call fast twitch. So the gastrocnemius uh, is a fast twitch muscle fiber but unlike the extraocular muscles, we uh, describe the metabolic strategy of the gastrocnemius as a fast, I'm sorry, fast oxidative glycolytic, or FOG fibers. Now, these fiber types generate force slightly slower than the fast glycolytic fibers, but they're capable of sustaining the force uh, for longer periods of time. And when we say that they're capable of sustaining force for longer period of time, that is synonymous with being less fatigable or that they fatigue slower. And then finally, the soleus muscle is an example of the slow twitch or type 1 muscle fiber type. And the metabolic strategy of this fiber type is slow oxidative oxidation, or basically ana I'm sorry, basically aerobic metabolism. And because of this metabolic strategy, these muscle fiber types generate force slowly, but because they rely primarily uh, on aerobic metabolism, they are slow to fatigue. And so these comprise. Uh, our endurance muscles. And we would expect to find these uh, different muscle fiber types uh, in different proportions uh, depending upon uh, specific muscles that we look at. So for example, muscles that uh, are responsible for long sustained duration activities such as the soleus muscle would be expected to have a high percentage uh, of these slow twitch uh, slow oxidative muscle fiber types. Uh, conversely, muscles that are responsible for generating high amounts of force quickly uh, for short periods of time would be expected to have higher concentrations and higher percentages uh, of your type 2A and even type 2B muscle fiber types. 
So let's take a look at a couple examples uh, of these muscle fiber types and, and their behaviors. And for those of you that have the PowerPoint presentation, I have here a diagram of a marathon runner. And by looking at his physique, you can see that his muscles are very slender and uh, relatively small. Now, this is uh, the type of somatotype that's perfectly suited for marathon running. And by biopsy of the muscles of this particular athlete, we find that he has a high percentage of the type 1 slow oxidative fibers because those fibers are the fibers that are perfectly adapted and perfectly suited for low level, low force production activities, uh, but activities that require sustained levels uh, and endurance levels of force, such as marathon running, such as muscles that are involved with posture, muscles that are involved with activities of daily living, muscles that are involved with low, an low intensity activities such as walking. And this makes perfect sense when you think of low intensity activities such as walking. Walking is an activity that can be sustained for significant durations of time. I mean, you could probably, uh, if you had to, you could walk for several hours uh, at a time. And it's not uncommon for people to walk, uh, you know, six hours at a time or be on their feet and walk for eight hours at a time if they're hiking or sightseeing or uh, walking for exercise or what have you. And the reason that those activities like walking can be sustained for hours at a time is because it relies on endurance muscle fibers uh, that are very, very fatigue resistant. Now, on the other hand, if you take a look at uh, these athletes, take a look at their muscle somatotypes, look at the muscles of their thighs, look at the muscles of their upper arms, and you see that they look substantially different uh, from the legs and arms of the marathon runner. And that's because these athletes are not marathon runners. These athletes are sprinters. And sprinters are athletes that produce high amounts of force, however, for very short durations of time. I mean, a 100-meter sprint is uh, sustained for, nowadays, less than 10 seconds. 200 meters is less than 20 seconds, and 400 meters is in the mid-30 seconds. So these are short-duration activities. I mean, we're talking less than a minute. Whereas walking, you can walk for hours. So these type of athletes uh, have high percentages of the type 2A fast oxidative glycolytic fibers, which are used for prolonged anaerobic activities, such as running, uh, such as a long sprint, such as carrying heavy objects. And also your type 2B fibers, your fast twitch type B fibers, which are the fast glycolytic fibers. These are used for very high force, very short duration anaerobic activities, such as jumping, such as short sprints, such as lifting heavy objects. And when you think about jumping, what is the duration of a jump? The duration of a jump is probably less than a second, correct? So when you jump, you're responsible for producing high amounts of force, but very short uh, duration or very, uh, uh, very quick actions. And that relies heavily on these type 2B glass fast glycolytic fibers. So different muscles throughout the body have different percentages and different proportions of these three muscle fiber types. Now, every muscle in the body has all three muscle fiber types. But depending upon the uh, type of activity that the body becomes accustomed to, uh, or the type of activity that the muscle is primarily responsible for, we will start to see differing percentages of these muscle fiber types. So let's think about this. Because the legs and the upper limbs uh, are responsible for short duration 
uh, high intensity activities, we tend to see a, a high percentage uh, of the type 2 muscle fibers, particularly in the upper limbs. I mean, if you think about it, there's very few activities that involve the upper limbs that are sustained hourly duration activities. Well, let's take a look at this athlete. This athlete is uh, our current Mr. Olymp Olympia, Phil Heath. And let's think about the type of activities that a bodybuilder engages in because uh, this is an extreme example of what this program is about. This program is about muscle hypertrophy. So here we see the most extreme example uh, in the world. I mean, Mr. Olympia is the, the current number one bodybuilder in the world. So here we see an extreme example of muscle hypertrophy. And how did this athlete get this way? Well, muscle builders... Uh, engage in high intensity, short duration activities such as lifting heavy objects. I mean, they lift, they lift very heavy objects, correct? Well, how long is the duration of a set of bench presses? Well, a, a set of bench presses is, is sustained for less than a minute. I mean, these guys typically do repetitions in the range of 8 to 12 repetitions with very heavy weights. And because the weights are so heavy, the duration of the activity is inversely proportional to the intensity of the activity. And so these uh, sets of bench presses and squats are sustained for very short durations. And that is what's responsible for activating high percentages and high large populations of your type 2B uh, fast twitch muscle fibers. So here we see an example of an athlete who in exaggerated proportions has increased his percentages and populations of type 2B muscle fibers. Now, let's compare and contrast uh, the properties uh, of the three different type of muscle fibers. And for those of you that have the PowerPoint presentation, you'll see that uh, we have a table here that compares the type 1 fibers with the type 2 fibers. And if we just go across the top of this table, we see that the type 1 muscle fibers uh, are, have a slow contraction time compared to the type 2 fibers. And the type 2B fibers have very fast contraction time. So that tells us that the type 2B fibers uh, are predominantly called into play with activities that require uh, very fast contractions, very high intensity, very fast, very uh, high velocity uh, movements. The activity that these uh, different types of muscle fibers are used for, the type 1 muscle fibers are used primarily for aerobic activities. The type 2A fibers are used for long-term anaerobic activities, whereas the type 2B fibers are used for short-term anaerobic activities. Now, because muscle hypertrophy, the whole concept of muscle hypertrophy uh, involves uh, growth of muscle fibers, we're going to see that it's the type 2B fibers that have the greatest capacity uh, for hypertrophy, whereas the type uh, 1 fibers have much less capacity for hypertrophy because they're smaller fibers uh, to begin with. So if we're going to focus on increasing our muscle mass and the cross-sectional area of our muscles, we're going to need to focus on short-term anaerobic, very fast types of activities. Finally, uh, if we take a look at the amount of power that is produced by these three different types of muscle fiber types, we see that the type 1 fibers are capable only of producing low levels uh, of power. And power is the ability to produce force quickly. Uh, remember from your physics training that the formula for power 
is force times distance over time. And if we break that up a little bit, we see that power is force times distance over time. And distance over time is the formula for velocity. Distance over time, such as miles per hour, is the formula for velocity. So power is the capacity to produce force quickly. And type 1 muscle fibers have very low capacity for power production. Type 2A fibers have high, uh, medium to high capacity to produce power. And then your type 2B fibers have very high capacity for producing power. In other words, they're able to produce force very quickly. So simply by looking at these different types of characteristics gives us, gives us uh, some insight as to what types of exercises we're going to need to engage in if our goal is to increase the cross-sectional area of our muscles. We're going to need to engage in activities that require very high productions of power, but that are sustained for short term short periods of time and also that involve very fast contraction actions. So we're starting to get our prescription now for hypertrophy. In order to promote hypertrophy, our training efforts have to target the type 2B muscle fibers because those are the fibers uh, that have any uh, capacity at all uh, for enlargement and growth. They have the greatest capacity for enlargement and growth because uh, they are the largest types of fibers uh, to begin with. So if we're going to increase the cross-sectional area uh, of our muscle fiber types, how, how are we going to do it? We have to find ways uh, and various different methods to train with heavy weights or to train uh, in, in a, a fashion that is high intensity. We have to train in a way that involves very fast contractions and high productions of power. Basically, we have to find ways to train heavy. Now, this can be the challenge, especially when we're dealing with special populations uh, that have issues such as uh, orthopedic in issues or cardiovascular issues. But nonetheless, uh, we have to find a way to train heavy. Now, heavy, I put in parentheses, or I put in quotes because heavy is relative. One person's heavy is another person's light. And just as our bodybuilder Phil Heath trains with very heavy weights at his maximum intensity, we could take a senior citizen uh, at 70 years of age and put them through a, a training program that looks from the outside to be very low intensity, for them it could actually qualify as high intensity and as heavy. So heavy is relative. But we have to find a way to train heavy in such a way that it stimulates and targets uh, the type 2B muscle fibers because those are the muscle fibers that have the capacity uh, for the greatest amount of growth. In conclusion, uh, this is Dr. Perry Carpenter. I hope you enjoyed this program. Uh, now you have a 20 question uh, examination that I need you to complete and either fax or email back to me. My fax number is on the top of the examination form and just as soon as I receive your examination form uh, I will provide you with a certificate of completion that you can use for your Board of Chiropractors uh, continuing education credit. For now, I want to leave you with uh, the website uh, for chiropractors, which is entitled ezchiropracticceu.com. We're always coming up with new programs, so check the website uh, frequently for new programs designed to help you uh, succeed as a chiropractor. Again, Dr. Perry Carpenter wishing you great success. If there's ever anything I can do to help you, feel free to call.
Again, thanks for being with me on this program, and best of success.